Hello, welcome. Um, today is our, our first webinar, which we'll be running with the IMRESTS Marine Mammal SIG. Um, it's our special interest group. Um, it's the first of a series of webinars we'll be running in 2022. Um, my name is Nira Dorian. I'm joined with Julie Jacobi. Um, and we will be hosting today's event. Um, I'm a marine mammal biologist, I'm senior environmental advisor, um, and I've been working in marine fauna rescue and rehabilitation for the past 15 years. Um, so this is a topic that is very, very interesting to me. And we've put together a, a wonderful lineup of, uh, of speakers today. Um, I'd just like to briefly introduce the Marine Mammal SIG. Um, we are uh, a group that is aiming to bridge the divide between marine mammal conservation and engineering communities. Um, and we have a few objectives. Um, the first is providing a forum for dialogue and raising awareness of crewing issues and professional development opportunities for a variety of roles in marine mammal consulting. We are aiming to contribute to policy debates at government and intergovernmental organization levels and developing professional standards for marine scientists working in an industrial setting. If you'd like to get more involved with our efforts um, and if uh, the, the topics that uh, you hear about today interest you, um, and you'd further like to support uh, marine mammal conservation and scientists in industry, you can register with the IMRS, uh, become a member and uh, look to join the committee. We'd uh, love to hear from you. So with today's topic, we are looking at ghost gear and marine fauna entanglement, and we're joined by um, Joe Basic, um, who will start our first uh, uh, lineup in our panel. Um, so I'd like to hand over to, to Joe, um, and he is representing the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Um, and he is coming from also the Ocean Conservancy. So please, Joel, take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nero. Let's just share my screen here. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, as as Nero said, my name is Joel Basic, the Associate Director of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Um, I'll take this opportunity to give sort of an overview of the global um, state of affairs when it comes to abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear or ghost gear, uh, and what the Triple GI or the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is all about. Um, just a quick bit of background: my uh, um, I spent 20 years in Canada's commercial fishing industry as an operations supervisor and set up an end of life net re recycling program there, which is how I became involved with this first in 2015. Um, so um, do have an industry background when it comes to that. Um, I'll try to go through these slides as quickly as I can to give um, everyone enough time uh, to do their own presentations and to have uh, sufficient time for questions at the end. So I apologize for the pace in advance. Um, but here we go. Um, so first question, what is ghost gear? Obviously, it's the common name for abandoned, lost, discarded fishing gear. Um, for any time that uh, fishing gear gets lost um, and is no longer under human um, human control, um, basically. Um, being purposely designed to capture marine life, it does so exceedingly well, whether it's um, under human control or not. And uh, so because of that, it is the most harmful form of marine debris. Um, and as far as how much is out there, it, it really, it, Estimates vary. Um, FAO in 2009 estimated that about 10% of marine debris would be fishing gear. More recent studies suggest that it could be between 46 and 70% of the floating macroplastic in the oceans by weight. Oh, sorry, in the ocean gyres, I should say, by weight. Um, but I should point out that there are varying estimates. There's no uniform scientifically agreed upon number of how much gear is either lost every year or how much is out there. We do know it's a lot. We do know it has significant impacts, but that's still an ongoing puzzle that um, every new study that comes out is a is an important piece of. And an estimated 5 to 30% of global harvestable fish populations, depending on where you are, um, is killed by ghost gear every year, which is a threat to global food security. It's a threat to coastal communities. It's a threat to fisher livelihoods. So um, it's definitely a, a concern for all of those things. As for the causes of ghost gear, we know that no fisher ever wants to lose their gear. It's expensive. It's the means by which fishers harvest species uh, around the world to feed three, three and a half or so billion people who depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. Um, but fishing is not a fair weather industry. And so some gear does get lost during normal fishing operations. It happens no matter where you are in the world. This is a ubiquitous issue. Um, and uh, some of the direct causes, you know, um, adverse weather conditions, strong currents, snags beneath the surface, marine traffic, potentially driving over and not realizing it's there, cutting it loose, um, spatial pressures coming into contact with um, lost gear, um, whether you're deploying gear and it's already been lost or other gear that's been deployed. There are a lot of different direct causes for it, um, most of which come into effect just during normal fishing operations. And of course, that, that will vary depending on the gear class that you're talking about. Um, 
there is some degree of intentional discard. It's often linked with illegal, unre unregulated, unreported fishing. Um, and it tends to disproportionately affect certain areas of the world where there's often a lack of basic disposal infrastructure. So it's not to point a finger at those regions. It's only to illustrate a reality that wherever there is a lack of disposal facilities or inaccessible or expensive disposal facilities, um, there, there can be um, situations where that gear gets discarded as a last resort. So what is the Triple GI? Uh, the Triple GI is housed under Ocean Conservancy as the host organization. It's the only cross-sectoral alliance committed to driving solutions to the problem of ghost gear worldwide. So we have a few different aims um, to improve the health of aquatic ecosystems, to protect aquatic life from harm, to safeguard human health and livelihoods. And each one of those things is equally important to the others. So we really do try to take a holistic approach here and we want to prevent um, gear from becoming lost, mitigate its impact when it does inevitably get lost in some cases, and remediating the effects uh, of gear via targeted removal efforts. Um, so we do take a holistic approach to the issue. Our theory of change is that everyone has a part to play in these in the prevention, mitigation, and remediation of uh, ALDFG or ghost gear. Um, just a quick snapshot of the reach of the Triple GI, 127 member organizations around the world, um, 18 supporting governments and four high level global affiliates. So it really is a, a space to convene all of these different organizations uh, that are interested in working on this topic from very small NGOs that have boots on the ground in regions around the world, all the way up to massive global corporates and everyone in between. So there's a space for everyone in the Triple GI if they're working on this particular topic. And that just gives a snapshot of the, of the reach of the organization uh, currently, but those numbers are constantly um, on the uptick. And just also another quick uh, shot of our members, um, some, some familiar logos that you'll see in there, but again, you can see we have a very wide diversity of members, um, you know, academia to technology companies, seafood companies, retailers, um, NGOs, um, really it is trying to, to be as cross-sectoral as we, as we can be, because everyone has a part to play. When it comes to engaging with the industry itself, um, engaging with the industry in a positive way is absolutely critical if we're gonna create the lasting meaningful change that we want to do. So a few key points when we're engaging with the fishing industry in particular, we wanna raise awareness about the issue. Uh, we wanna learn uh, or educate fishers about the reality of what's going on beneath the surface of the ocean uh, or rivers and lakes as, it, as this is not just a, uh, a maritime issue, but also um, one that affects our rivers and lakes wherever there's fishing, as I said. Uh, so to raise awareness about what's going on down there, um, there's a lot of lack of awareness um, in certain parts of the industry about how this issue actually is affecting their own harvestable fish populations. But that's a two-way street. We also wanna learn about the issue from the industry. What causes gear loss? What are the key drivers and where can we help? Um, we wanna develop innovative solutions uh, with the industry that minimize gear loss, that impact its or reduce its impact when it is lost. Uh, work with the industry to assure uh, that there are appropriate disposal options where possible um, and recycle uh, that gear where it is possible to do so. And then ensure that whatever the solutions are, that they're viable, they're lasting, and that they make sense for the industry. So this is really a collaborative uh, platform and uh, we pride ourselves on that. Um, we have developed a couple of documents uh, speaking on the industry side of things. The best practice frameworks for the management of fishing and aquaculture gear respectively, you can see the covers there in the bottom left. They are comprehensive guidance documents referencing all major actors in the seafood supply chain for wild capture and that went with aquaculture. Um, so there are high, high level global risk assessments contained within both documents focused on the gear classes, um, in each of those uh, two different um, categories, and then the relative risks of likelihood of loss and then impact if lost um, to each other. Um, so the, the risk assessments that are contained in there are global in nature. They're designed, however, to be a starting point from which you can um, assess the risks um, in a, on a more granular level. And so the guidance, again, is across prevention, mitigation, and recovery strategies. And it is also um, for um, all of the different actors within the seafood supply chain. So there will be specific sections for, for example, fish harvesters, um, fishing companies, retailers, um, governments, and regulating authorities, et cetera. Uh, so it really is supposed to be tailored um, advice to each of those different stakeholder groups. And the idea is um, not for this to sit on a shelf somewhere, but for the, the um, 
uh, strategies and the uh, recommendations therein to be useful. Uh, it was developed with a lot of industry and stakeholder consultation to come up with this set of recommendations. Um, and they're designed to be incorporated into global sourcing policies, CSR documents, fisheries management plans, seafood certification programs, voluntary guidelines, um, workshops, project work. They really are uh, meant to be as comprehensive as possible uh, as a way to, um, again, work with the industry to come up with solutions. Um, also, just quickly mention our Triple GI data portal, which is the largest uh, collection of ghost gear data on Earth. Um, it's available at the uh, link below. We are currently transitioning over to version 2.0 as we speak, um, which will be officially launched later in the year. Um, but uh, it, it collects data from dozens of different data organizations around the world on gear loss, so specific data points, um, both large and small and um, from users of our Ghost Gear Reporter app as well, which you can find a link to on our website um, so that anybody uh, can report gear loss and images, um, et cetera, to, to the portal. Um, the new version of the portal will offer a host of new ways to interact with those data, including user uh, and host organizational level logins, data sharing agreements built into the portal itself, which will allow us to actually share a lot of the data that's in there for research purposes um, and uh, really become the one-stop shop for all things um, ALDFG data related. So if anybody has any data that they would be interested in submitting and obviously having it properly credited to your organization, uh, please get in touch with me. We are um, always interested in, in new data sets and new sources. And touching on some of our solutions projects, we have ongoing projects in many areas around the world. Um, these are just a few. Um, project objectives will vary, but they might consist of data gathering, hotspot analysis, predictive modeling, fisher surveys to understand what's going on on the ground, um, community and fisher engagement, targeted gear removal and recycling where possible, um, testing of new technologies, um, gear marking trials, setting up locations for end-of-life gear, gear disposal, et cetera. And it could be any combination of those things depending on the local needs. Um, again, the idea of Triple GI projects isn't to go in, do some removal, take some photos and then leave. We really want to understand the key local drivers, um, developing phased projects with uh, the long-term goal of creating that lasting systemic change where it's needed most. I am actually going to leave it there. Um, I'm sure there will be time for questions and I just wanna make sure that everyone else has enough time to, uh, to go into their topics as well. So uh, I will pause it there and hand it back over to Nero. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joel. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, I see we've got some good questions coming in already. So please keep those questions coming and we will target them at the end of the, the, run, the, the run through. Um, but I'm going to hand over now to uh, Dr. Alex Lareo from the Energy O Alliance. Um, Alex, if you can share your screen, please. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for having me this morning. I'm very glad to be joining you. Um, Joel, that was a fantastic presentation. I think you and I need to have a conversation at a future date. Um, so as Nira said, my name is Alex Lerero. I'm the Director of Marine Environment and Biology uh, for the Energy Alliance. Real briefly, before we dive in, I just want to give you a, an introduction to the Energy Alliance and who we are. Um, up until last month, we were known as the International Association of Geophysical Contractors, or IAGC, which is quite a mouthful. Um, you might hear me call us IA Energeo. I'm still getting used to it myself. Um, but we are the Global Trade, Trade Association for the Energy Geoscience Industry. Um, our members include seismic survey operators and acquisition companies, energy data and processing providers, energy companies, and any other related industry providers. Um, our members really are the gateway to the safe discovery, development, and delivery of mainstay energy sources, alternative energy, and low carbon solutions. So let's get right into it and talk about marine debris. Um, as I'm sure you all know, marine debris is a major international problem. All of this debris needs to be cleaned up. Uh, for example, U.S. states on the West Coast alone spend about $500 million a year just to clean the beaches. Uh, pollution also damages industry year. We're looking at about $13 billion in damage annually. Um, this includes the seismic industry, of course, which regularly deploys very expensive equipment that can easily become entangled and damaged. And that's to say nothing of the marine life negatively affected. So studies have found that about a million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals die each year from plastic pollution. And that figure, of course, does not include sublethal impacts. So anything that may uh, adversely affect health and fecundity of individuals or population, um, any of those impacts that don't kill animals outright, but may ne negatively affect their long-term well-being. 
And we have another problem to contend with recently as well, and that is waste associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously this includes a major surge in single-use medical supplies, personal protective equipment. Um, Those things are important. We have to use them. It's a necessary part of our lives right now. Um, We want to be mindful about how those things are disposed, but it has caused a major uptick in just general waste. Um, But we also need to think about the other ways that our lives and our behaviors have changed. So many of these habits are going to likely stick with us post-pandemic. I know um, our ordering of takeout delivery food has gone way up. Um, It's very different as far as packaging and plastic waste than ordering in a restaurant. Um, I know I've developed a Clorox wipe habit. You may have to pry those out of my hands at your own risk. Um, So these habits are likely here to stay. And that has, of course, resulted in a major increase in waste and debris. Um, And that's where the GhostNet initiative of the Energy Alliance comes in. Um, So finding and removing marine debris is already a routine part of marine seismic operations. Propellers, thrusters, streamers, other equipment can get lost or damaged if it becomes stuck or entangled. And also marine life may be encountered in debris, either dead or in distress. And sometimes those interactions can overlap with equipment interactions. That creates a potentially dangerous situation that needs to be dealt with very carefully. Uh, It's also a major environmental issue that our members and industry partners have identified as a priority, and that I think makes a lot of sense to me. You know, people who make their living at sea care about the environment, they see the damage that marine debris can cause firsthand, and they really want to be a part of the solution. Uh, So this is an opportunity for our member companies to demonstrate their corporate good citizenship, uh, their ESG efforts. And in the last few years, members have received overwhelmingly positive responses when they uh, share that they've removed marine debris from the environment or freed marine life that was found entangled. Um, And of course, that's an issue that the public and the governments globally have cared about for a long time. And centralizing the industry's efforts through the GNI allows us to really share um, how large of a contribution the industry can make toward marine debris removal. Um, To date, since the program's initiation, I think in 2016, 2017, uh, our members have reported removal of about two and a half million pounds of debris from the environment. So conversations with our members during one of our GNI webinars ultimately inspired the develop of our entangled animal guidance. Uh, Members reported that encounters with animals entangled in debris, but they noted that they did not have specific procedures in place to manage these interactions. Um, We always encourage animal professionals as the first option, but many of these surveys occur in remote areas where that's just simply not possible. That kind of support is just not available. And while geophysical survey crews are highly safety trained professionals, uh, fortunately, we haven't seen any major accidents, any incidents or injuries. Um, But we also saw an opportunity here to provide some more support. So we gathered a group of four animal experts, including Nero. Thank you very much for being a part of that. Um, as well as a representative from our environment work group to share some context from the industry side. Um, And I actually have a marine mammal husbandry background as well. So this was a very exciting project for me um, to be able to to start. Um, The goal of our guidance was to develop something specific for geophysical survey crews that builds on their extensive training experience and their safety training rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, So that said, this can definitely be used by any professionals that have this safety training background. It really is intended to build off of that rather than start things over from the beginning. The guidance itself is broken down into three major categories. That's pre-survey deployment and preparation, uh, guidance for managing the interaction and information for uh, what information to collect and who to contact when you encounter uh, entangled marine life. So during this first phase, we really encourage our members to use the environmental impact assessment process to determine which species are in the area and the appropriate stranding and regulatory contacts. Uh, As I said before, we always encourage contacting professionals as the first option, whether that's the local stranding network or the regulatory authority. Um, But this is also a good time to determine the relevant laws guiding wildlife interactions. And finally, we want to prepare with a solid intervention plan and identify those lines of communication Um, We've also provided a list of gear to have available so that can be prepared in advance. During the interaction, human safety is always number one. Any interaction with wildlife poses a risk of injury or death, even if it doesn't look like a potentially dangerous situation. Um, Ask me how I know how strong a manatee can be. We found out the hard way. Um, That risk is heightened when animals are in distress, of course. Um, But we've provided guidelines for disentanglement in a way that minimizes risk of injury while also avoiding self-entanglement and minimizing the risk of zoonotic disease spread, which of course has become even more of a priority in the last couple of years. 
Um, the bottom line here is that during the interaction, any, per any person can stop the disentanglement efforts at any time if they feel the situation has become potentially dangerous uh, to human safety. Uh, animal safety is a close second here. And for folks who have not previously worked with wildlife, I think this is probably where the guidance is most helpful. Um, it's not necessarily intuitive to handle an animal that's built for an aquatic environment. So we've walked through how to minimize the risk of injury, how to monitor the animal's temperament, other potential hazards to be aware of. Um, for example, conspecifics for animals that travel in groups can be a real hazard. And so we've provided some guidance for how to monitor um, those animals during the interaction. Um, we've also highlighted that it's important to not attempt to address any other health condition or provide food. Um, I think this is a big one because people want to help, but really this can do more harm than good. Um, you know, we've seen cases of folks trying to scrape barnacles off of turtles, causing some major damage. Um, feeding animals, of course, always presents, uh, presents a risk of injury or illness. Um, so that's something that we want to make sure we're avoiding during these interactions. And then lastly, we've provided a comprehensive list of the information to collect when communicating with rescue professionals, whether that's the stranding network or the regular regulator. Um, a lot of this is, is fairly intuitive, but it's easy to lose details in the shuffle when you're not prepared. And so I think it's helpful to have this list handy um, so you can collect as much detail as possible when you're communicating about those interactions um, with whoever those relevant professionals might be. And then finally, just a couple of key reminders for anyone interested in using the guidance. First, we've compiled a list of resources to review. Um, I always consider these documents living documents, much to the chagrin of our communication staff. Um, but if you have other relevant resources, please feel free to share those with me. I would very much love to incorporate those um, so we can make those available. Um, we always remind our members that they are responsible for reviewing and complying with the policies of the local governing jurisdiction. Every country is different, and we always need to abide by those laws and regulations, uh, whichever those might be um, in the area in which we're operating. And then finally, as I've said a couple of times, um, trained professionals are always the best option. And if there is any doubt whatsoever about the ability to disentangle an animal while maintaining human and animal safety, and uh, the right choice is always to report the sighting and not intervene uh, with that animal. So with that, I'll just say uh, thank you very much for having me. My contact information is here. Please don't hesitate to get in touch. And you can also download the guidance um, at our GhostNet initiative uh, page on our website. So if you're interested in reviewing that, we have made it publicly available because we feel that it's important um, to share that information with as many people as possible. So I encourage you to check that out. And if you have any notes, edits, um, anything that you'd like to see us add to that resources section, I would definitely welcome that feedback. Um, so with that, thank you very much, Niru, and thank you all for joining this morning. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, I would just like to uh, follow on with uh, Sarah Dolman. Uh, Sarah is a policy officer from the Whale and Dolphin Conservation, um, and she is representing the Scottish Entanglement Alliance. Um, but thank you very much, Alex. Very interesting, and uh, I'll love to get into these questions um, that we're seeing coming in at the end of the, the, the session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Dolman, and I work for Whale and Dolphin Conservation. Um, I learned a lot from those first two presentations some really important work happening out there. And I'm just gonna shift the focus slightly now um, onto entanglement specifically. And I'm gonna be talking about the scale and impacts of entanglements that have happened in the Scottish krill fishery. So this is a project of the Scottish Entanglement Alliance. It's a partnership of six bodies um, and the bodies are Nature Scott, oh, excuse me, government agency, um, the Scottish Krill Fishermen's Federation, WDC, the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme, the Hebridean Well and Orphan Trust, and British Divers and Marine Life Rescue. And the goal of the Alliance is to um, provide comprehensive monitoring program to understand the scale of impacts around the Scottish coastline. Um, SEA was initiated by um, the creel sector itself after it, um, it became aware of entanglement concerns and it's a two-year project that's been funded by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. So we've got a number of goals. The first was to raise awareness of marine animal entanglements within the fishing industry, to assess the risk of entanglements for individuals and for populations, to provide opportunities for fishermen to become involved in entanglement research and disentanglement efforts, and to understand the socioeconomic impacts of entanglements on the fishing fleet itself. So there are four components to the project. 
um, and the first was analysing strandings data. And so the Scottish strandings data was analysed over a period of 15 years. And you can see from this uh, table that there are actually a range of species entangled that then subsequently stranded um, 12 different species. You can also see there's been an increase in the reporting of entanglement cases since 2014. And I'll provide some more data later that substantiates that as being a real increase in entanglements rather than um, an effort bias or anything else. And thirdly, the, common, uh, the most commonly reported stranded animal that is showing signs of entanglement are minke whales. Using the strandings data, we also looked at the distribution of entanglements around the coastline. And as you can see, um, there are some hotspot areas, but strandings do happen everywhere. And there's no spatial segregation um, by species, despite the, uh, the extensive number of species that have been entangled. And we also looked at the data seasonally to see if there are particular times of year when different species become entangled. Um, and minke whales come into Scottish waters in the springtime. Um, they stay here through the summer and autumn months to feed. And then most of the population leave during the winter to find breeding grounds. And, and you can see here that most of the entanglements of minke whales happen between April um, and, and the end of the autumn. Humpback whales, there's a peak between March and June. And for leatherback turtles, most of the entanglements happen in the autumn months. And entanglement is, of course, a significant welfare issue for individuals. Um, chronic entanglements are mostly eventually fatal. And so we felt the need to quantify the impact for individuals and for populations. So I'm going to provide you with a few case studies. Um, and the first one is an unusual entanglement because it was a Sowerby's beaked whale that became entangled. Um, and as a deep water offshore species, this is not a species that we would anticipate um, getting entangled. Um, this female was alive when she stranded on the coast not far from Edinburgh. Um, and as you can see from this um, rather graphic photograph, this piece of braided twine has gone through her skin and her blubber um, and is embedded in the back of her neck. So this female was in very poor body condition when she came ashore. Her body showed severe damage from having carried the gear and one of her dorsal fins, one of her um, pectoral fins was almost amputated. The, the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme said that it was the most significant welfare case they had ever, ever observed. And I have to say it was the most gruesome post-mortem that I've attended. The second case study is a much more typical event. This is a minke whale entanglement. You can see here the rope marks around the tail of this individual. Um, and so minke whales often become entangled around the tail, although they do get entangled around other parts of their body. Uh, minke whales are quite small. They grow up to about 10 meters. They're quite streamlined animals. And so once they get entangled in the creel ropes, they, they often are tethered under the water they get anchored there. And so they dry drown, they close their blowhole up um, and fatality um, occurs often within minutes or if they're unfortunate within hours. And it's quite a different case for humpback whales. Humpback whales are much bigger. They grow to about 15 meters. They're much stockier animals. They've got much more weight behind them. And so when they get entangled, sometimes they can pick the gear up and carry it with them. And so we often see chronic entanglements um, sometimes around the pectoral fins, they have these big knobbly pectoral fins, um, which, which get entangled and, and other parts of their body become entangled as well. And so for humpback whales, it's much more likely to be a severe long term issue. Um, and although they do sometimes dry drown in the same way that minke whales do, it's more common for humpback whales to, um, to carry the gear um, and then not be able to feed. And so they suffer from malnutrition or secondary injuries, infection, or, or other debilitations. And, and so this case study is, um, is a humpback whale that, that eventually stranded, again, just outside Edinburgh, where I'm based. And this whale was spotted in the Firth of Forth in February, a couple of years ago, carrying the fishing gear, and then subsequently stranded a couple of months later, um, in very poor condition, uh, having suffered for, um, for, for a considerable amount of time. The second phase of our project uh, was focused on working with fishermen to understand about more about how entanglements happen. 
So we conducted 109, 159 interviews with the Scottish Creole fishing fleet. So that's 11% of the sector here in Scotland. And over the course of the last 10 years, they reported 146 entanglements. We only knew about three of those previously, which demonstrates to us that fishermen just weren't aware of the fact that it's important um, or that there's value in, in, um, in reporting entanglements. In the same way with the strandings data, you can see in this table that 12 species have been reported by fishers as, as being entangled in their gear in Scottish waters. This table separates the animals that were found alive versus those that were found dead. Um, and for the two most commonly entangled species, that's minke whales and basking sharks, they're more often found dead in the gear. Whereas humpback whales and leatherback turtles are more often found alive and so, of course, there's a chance that they can be um, they can be rescued. So of those fishermen who reported having had an entanglement, they considered it to be a once in a lifetime occurrence. That is, individually, it happens very rarely. But there's so much creel gear um, around uh, the coast of Scotland that collectively it is having a problem for marine species. Positively, marine um, the majority of fishers were willing to trial mitigation measures, to attend training events for reporting entangled animals, um, to sample dead animals um, or uh, disentanglement training. Um, and also positively, um, the economic impact to the fishermen is minimal and they were much more concerned about the, the impact of the animal than they were losing their gear. So the next, the third stage of our project was looking at the risk of entanglement. So we used data um, collected by the Hebridean Well and Dolphin Trust to overlay minke whale sightings on the west coast of Scotland with cre where creels are set in the same area. And you can see in this map that the larger and the darker the dots, the more likely there is for a minke whale to become entangled in creel gear. And so there are a couple of hotspots around the coast of Skye and off the east coast of um, the, the Western Isles and off the West Coast as well. And creels are widespread throughout inshore waters. That's not a surprise to us. But there has been an upward trend in the number of creels encountered in recent years. So that tallies with the first figure that I showed you, the graph um, of the increase in entanglements. And the reports here support fishers' own concerns about the increased creel effort. And fishers, of course, are concerned primarily about reduction in catch whereas our primary concern is an increase in entanglements. And so the final stage of this project was looking at entanglement survivors. And the Hebridean Well and Dolphin Trust have a brilliant um, catalogue of minke whale photo identification, 27 years worth of data. And, um, and this catalogue was reviewed looking for evidence of entanglement and fishing gear, both ropes um, and nets, but also things like fish packing strap, as you can see here. And what we found was that of the 256 whales in their catalogue, a fifth of them had survived an entanglement event. And of course, minke whales are highly mobile species. They move in and out of Scottish waters. So we don't know where all of the entanglements occurred, but we do know that at least some of them happened in Scottish waters, having spoken to the fishermen. So to summarise, how much of a problem is entanglement in Scottish waters? Well, I hope I've convinced you that entanglement is a significant welfare issue, that it causes serious injury to individuals. Um, it likely causes great distress and, and ultimately death. Um, we are concerned that entanglements might be affecting the local populations of minke whales around Scotland, that it might be preventing humpback whales recovering from old whaling days at the rate they are in some other parts of the world. And we've also got a concern for Rizzo's dolphins. Um, around the Scottish coastline, Rizzo's dolphins feed mainly on octopus, and octopus feed on crabs, lobsters, and other shellfish, which is the, um, the catch that the fishermen are after. And so we see the Rizzo's dolphins feeding around the crab, crab pots, um, looking for the octopus, um, and, that, and there are a number of um, entanglements of this species. So in conclusion, the Creole industry has been very positively engaging with this issue and we couldn't have done this piece of work without them. So we're very grateful for their support. Um, this study needs to be extended to other 
parts of the fishing industry, of course, because trawls, purse seines, and static nets um, all have issues with entanglement too. We're now seeking funding to implement some solutions. And the good news is that solutions exist. And basically, wherever large whales and this kind of fishing gear overlap, there are entanglement issues. And this is the case in the west coast of Australia, um, around South Africa, and the east and the west coast of the US, for example. And in some of those places, like Western Australia, they've eliminated entanglements altogether by implementing um, specific gear restrictions. And so what we need to do in Scotland is trials to look at the feasibility, the costs and the implications of some of these gears. And, and we want to start with sinking ground lines. We need improved reporting systems for fishers so that we can um, continue to fill the data gaps going forward. And the industry needs to be regulated to reduce creel fishing effort. At the moment, there's no regulation of creel fishing around the Scottish coastline. Um, the number of vessels, all the creels deployed, all the hauling frequency. A few years ago, the Scottish government proposed to put new inshore fishing legislation in place, and that was before Brexit, so there have been some delays, but, but I'm hoping that that's the path we'll go down in the future. If anybody is interested to um, receive a copy of the final report from this two-year project, then, then it's available online uh, on the Nature Scott website. Um, and if anyone who's listening in today is based in Scotland, there's a live motion um, in Scottish Parliament. And so if you're interested and concerned about this issue and you're willing to talk to your, um, to your member of Scottish Parliament, then, um, then I would encourage you to get in touch with them and ask them to sign the motion. That would be um, a, a really positive way to support this work. So I just want to finish up by thanking the fishermen um, who gave their time to assist with, with the project um, and to thank you for all of your time today. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was that was very interesting. I, I had a question. Do you have um, um, any picture of a, of a creel that, that might actually be deployed just to, for a visual representation? Um, I can probably find one if you give me a minute to do that. No problem. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hand over to uh, to Julia um, and she's going to go through the Q&A. Um, and so please, if you if you have any questions for a, a wonderful panel, please uh, pop them in the, the Slido questions and, uh, and Julia will deal with those. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, Sarah, if you if you do manage to find maybe we can we can pop it in at the end and share your screen. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Also from my side, uh, there are a few questions already. And there's one which should really be answered. A lot of people like that question. Um, this question is for Alex. So I would just start with you. Um, is it going to be a requirement that this guidance is uh, on board every vessel at sea? That's a great question. Um, so it's, it's not a requirement, right? Because every country, every jurisdiction sets their own requirements as far as what's um, necessary to have on board your vessels. Now that said, um, this has been very well received by our membership because the name of the game in the geophysical industry and really in any maritime industry is always safety first, right? Safety, safety, safety. That's always number one, no matter what you're doing. And so when we have situations where um, if you have, for example, you know, a, a net wrapped around a streamer that is now also wrapped around a turtle and you have to bring that streamer back on board, that is a really potentially dangerous situation. You know, even relatively small sea turtles have the potential to cause injury. And so um, while these situations are, are somewhat rare, you know, it's, it's certainly not happening every single day. Um, our member companies do want to be prepared for any eventuality. And so the uptake has been strong. It's not a requirement because those requirements are set by the countries. Um, but we think that this is something that our members will take on board because it does allow them to be safer while they're at sea. And that's always the end goal during operations. Thank you so much. I totally agree with that. And actually, we can just continue because the next question is for you, too. Um, and actually for Nero as well. So how did you come up with the project about entanglement and where can I find this guide? Is it available to the public? I think you shared a, a link already, but how can I find it in the internet? Yeah, well, let me actually show you. So I'll, um, I'll share my screen and I'll show you exactly where to find it. Um, so if you go to our website and then you go to the policy and issues page um, and the GhostNet initiative link over here, um, you can see some information on our GNI, and if you scroll down, 
Um, it's this link right here. It will open up. You'll see it's still uh, IHEC branded. We're still working through transitioning that over to Energy Alliance, um, but you can download that guidance on our website for free. It is available to the public. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I will just continue with Joel. Um, why is there a lack of disposal facilities and what happens with the gear in these facilities? Recycling, incineration? It's a really good question. As I mentioned earlier, I um, had started a, an end of life net recycling program um, here in Canada, where I am in the largest harbor in the country. Um, we at the time were doing burial um, in a landfill, and that was the only option available. There was no recycling option here. Um, there was no other option. Some of some of them are buried, some of them are incinerated, and honestly, it depends on where you go. Um, I had mentioned that in some areas there just are no disposal options. Well, previously there weren't either really. I mean, we could send to a landfill, but in some places, um, you know, small islands, for example, that don't have um, any type of disposal infrastructure at all, um, that those nets could end up anywhere. Um, they can end up um, discarded on a beach. They could end up discarded in the marine environment. They could also end up just piling up somewhere, um, which is what we see here. I see, you know, nets with, uh, or sorry, fishers, backyards with nets starting to pile up because there was no disposal option. So um, I think it's one of those things that it's a difficult type of thing to dispose of. And it also depends on the type of gear. I mean, a seine net, for example, can weigh 20,000 pounds or more, right? It's it's a very difficult thing to try to dispose of. So you need specialized um, facilities in order to do that. And I think there just hasn't been um, a significant awareness about the issue um, until recent years. And now um, you're starting to see more port side reception facilities. It's one of the top recommendations um, in our guidance, but in other guidance as well, when it comes to prevention of this type of thing. And people are starting to realize that the um, materials that they're made out of, whether it's nylon, um, nylon six specifically, or polyethylene, polypropylene, they are recyclable materials, uh, but the, the material itself is difficult to work with. It also needs to be separated from all of its different component pieces so that only the recyclable bits go to be recycled. Um, so it's a labor intensive process. It's a very long, answer that I could go into a lot more detail of, but I think for the for the purposes of here, if, you, if you'd if you like to learn more, feel free to reach out um, and get in touch with me. But uh, it's a very complicated issue and um, transportation, logistics, all the rest of those types of things um, factor into the factor into the situation. I think that this is something that is um, being addressed at the EU level in particular under the single use plastics directive, where by 2025, all member states in the EU will have to implement an extended producer responsibility program to cover the funding of things like port side reception facilities, transportation networks to get it to where it needs to be recycled, et cetera. So there are pieces in play right now. Um, all eyes are sort of on the EU when it comes to that. Um, they're sort of leading the way. Um, and then we'll see what, what happens from there. But again, there are smaller scale um, projects around the world as well. Thank you so much. Um, I will just check if there's another question for you. Um, okay, a lot of questions came in and here is one for you. Um, is the GGGI only doing the theoretical work or are you also organizing beach cleanups or similar? Uh, no, our work runs the gamut. So um, as I mentioned, we, we have um, some preliminary um, fisher surveys or um, hotspot modeling, or sorry, predictive modeling, hotspot analysis. Those types of things are the theoretical sides of things. And that's generally where we like to start a project so that we can understand where is the issue um, geospatially, where does it occur? But we do do removal efforts. It's usually um, targeted removal. So if there's a critically sensitive habitat or an area, um, sort of like the hotspots that were pointed out um, in Sarah's presentation, where there are overlaps with um, you know, where some of these um, entanglements might be occurring, things like that, then we will do targeted removal efforts for sure. Some of it's fairly, fairly large scale, but I think, um, uh, so we do run the gamut of all the different types of solutions. It's really tailored to where uh, the local conditions are and, and what the requirements are there. Um, and I think uh, it's important for, for us to, to uh, focus on prevention as well, though, because I think the more that we can prevent from getting there in the first place, um, it's, the, it's the turn off the tap type of uh, analogy that's used so often when it comes to marine debris is that that's where the focus is, but we do all aspects of, um, of work in the space. So right through, to, right through to removal. Great work. So, um, and I believe the next question is also for you. I will just continue with you. Um, how can I help tackle this problem whilst working as a consultant that contributes to EIA, MMRAs and mitigation plans? Um, 
It's a. Uh, it would depend on the specific needs and the specific areas of expertise. But um, for the sake of um, brevity, I will just say probably best to reach out to me directly, and we can see where some of those intersections might might come into play. Thank you very much. And then I think I have a question for Sarah. Um, what is the soak time for creel fishing? Is a requirement for fishers to remain near the gear while fishing viable? Sorry, what was the second part of the question? The second part is, um, is a requirement for fishers to remain near the gear while fishing viable? Uh, no, there's that the, there aren't any requirements. Um, most most fishers leave their gear out for um, for a few days at a time. Um, we have what's called wet storage in Scotland, which means that in some places fishers will leave their gear in the water, um, uh, and often it doesn't come ashore; it'll stay in the water, and and they'll empty the pots and and throw them back out again. Um, but in some cases, it's um, it can be a kind of a territorial thing so leaving your gear in your patch um, is, a, is an indication that this is where you're fishing um, uh, and, and as a kind of disincentive for other kinds of fishing to, to use that area. Thank you so much and uh, there's actually uh, two more questions for you I will just combine them because they're kind of similar or maybe you have a suggestion. Um, what strategies are you suggesting that fishermen take to avoid entanglement and the next person asks, um, wouldn't it be a good idea to teach these fishermen about the guide Alex just introduced? Yes, I, I, think, that's, um, I think that's a very good idea. And, and actually, uh, it's the first I've heard of it. So I will definitely follow those links that, um, that Alex sent, have a read of that, and then get in touch with Alex to, um, yeah, to see what, um, what use we can put that to in Scotland. Because of course, we, we want to try any suggestions. Um, there are lots of ways that fishermen can help to prevent entanglements. Um, we've produced a best practice guide, which just has some kind of common sense measures about not having excess rope in the water column so that it's kind of loosely hanging in the water um, and avoiding wet storage. So if, if you're not using your gear to take it out of the water, um, so there's less chance of animals getting entangled it, in it. And also, so there's less chance of um, the weather, you know, taking it away um, and it becoming ghost gear. Um, one of the kind of practical solutions that we're going to investigate first is the sinking ground line. So we've got a concern that I'll just I'll show the picture of the um, of the creels uh, here, so you can see. And although in this picture um, it looks like um, the the rope is sat on the seabed. What happens in reality between each of the pots is that the rope loops up into the water and most of the minke whale and basking shark entanglements appears to happen between the pots um, on the seabed. So sinking ground line means using different kind of rope that sits more heavily in the water. So it's on the seabed rather than looping up into the water. And, and we think that we can, we can almost eliminate um, minke whale and basking shark entanglements by doing that. Um, it's a bit more complicated with humpback whales. They tend to get caught on the end lines, which is the, the bit that comes up to the surface. And so that requires different solutions. But um, we're really hoping this year to start trials of sinking ground line um, on the west coast of Scotland to, to make sure that those um, that that new rope works for fishermen to make sure that it doesn't take more time. It's not, not any more difficult for them to bring, um, bring on board um, when they're hauling um, and, and just to kind of check out the practicalities of it. And then ideally, uh, over the long term, over the next few years, we would like to see that gear implemented throughout, throughout the fleet, assuming that it works. And, and, and if that's the case, then, then I think we've got a real chance of quite dramatically reducing entanglements in the next five or 10 years. Thank you so much for showing us again. And it would be really great to see you guys working together. That would be so awesome. Um, okay, there are a lot of more questions. Um, the next one is for Alex again. Um, what happens with the removed waste? We had this question yeah, before for Shovel, so maybe you have another um, idea. 
Yeah, so all of our uh, member companies will have a waste disposal plan for while they're at sea. Um, so it's, it's going to depend on the specific port where they're coming in. Uh, but of course, you know, we, we try to minimize generation of waste. Any of our member companies will try and avoid things like single use plastics while at sea. But there are some things that, that simply can't be avoided, right? Whether that's single use personal protective equipment or, you know, whatever the case may be, there's always going to be some waste generated. Um, and so those uh, ghost gear or other marine debris that's retrieved during those surveys will be disposed of uh, in compliance with whatever that waste disposal plan is. And again, that's going to depend on where that vessel is headed to port. Yeah, all right, thanks. Um, I would go with the next one for Sarah again. Uh, how do you know that the big whale got entangled in active gear? Could it have been ghost gear? That's an interesting one, actually. Yeah, it is an interesting question. And I think it's a question that needs a lot more attention because I think there are a lot of gaps between um, animals that get entangled in active gear versus ghost gear. I think we need to learn an awful lot more about it. I think in some cases it is possible to tell. Um, increasingly in Scotland now we get um, photographs or videos from the fishermen themselves. They'll let us know when, the anim when they get back to their gear and they find an animal entangled in it, then obviously it's active gear. Um, but um, likewise, um, there are also incidences of stranded entangled animals and I'm thinking about a, a pregnant female minke whale that stranded in Scotland a couple of years ago and she had become entangled in a, just a piece from a trawl um, net so you know fishermen will cut out um, a broken piece of net and repair it and this piece had obviously been discarded um, gone overboard and and so it wasn't a whole piece of gear but just a piece of gear and so it's more likely that you know that that was ghost gear and of course in some older um, fishing gear you can tell by um, how much um, other marine life has accumulated on it you know if it's been around for, for a long time then then the chances are it's, it's ghost gear. All right um this one the next question is not addressed to anyone so i will just ask it and whoever wants to answer first please go ahead um how can you fix entanglement in other ee set i'm just going to jump to a conclusion sure. economic exclusion zones is that is that how, what, what this person is referring to anyone familiar with eez in this in this context Exclusive economic zone, I think, is what they're talking about. Um, okay. But I'm still not sure that I quite understand what the question's getting at. Are we talking about like what can be done on the high seas? I think if that is the, or, or if that's what the um, question is referring to, I would think, um, you know, there are in, there are um, international conventions, MARPOL, for example, that are enforceable on the high seas. Um, there is, uh, you know, some ongoing conversations around this topic um, at those types of things, but a lot of the stuff that we're talking about and has been referenced by Alex um, is that there are voluntary guidelines, like most of the stuff that comes out from FAO, for example, um, the voluntary guidelines for the marking of fishing gear, for example, voluntary guidelines, our best practice frameworks, are voluntary guidelines. So um, they would have to be done through an organization like um, Marpol, um, I would think, in order for them to have, you know, whatever guidance would, would be adopted at that level is enforceable. Um, but again, it's a very complicated question. Um, I hope I'm getting to the to the essence of what's being asked there. I don't know, Alex or Sarah, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, you know, I, I think the short answer is that there really is no way to fix entanglement. The only thing you can do is prevent it in the first place um, and then try to intervene when those situations present themselves. Um, and so, you know, I, I would certainly encourage that communication and collaboration is always the best route towards ensuring that, you know, everybody has the best available information, that we're using voluntary guidelines insofar as possible. Um, but really, there is no such thing as, as fixing entanglement. It's really just a question of prevention and avoiding those situations in the first place. And it, it does become difficult when it's an issue of, you know, national sovereignty to determine what their requirements are for fishing gear deployment. We can't have one country influencing another necessarily, but what we can do is try and collaborate and share any voluntary guidance that we have in order for, to prevent those situations from occurring in the first place. And just to quickly follow on to that, and it links to the last question, the previous question too, um, 
I just want to point out one thing that the Canadian government, for example, has done recently is um, made it a requirement of licensing that you report gear when it's lost for all harvesters. And they've created a very sophisticated online portal to do that, um, developed by a Triple GI member called Work Dynamics, who um, that portal is now uh, online and accessible to fishers. They can report gear. They have to. It's mandatory. It's a condition of their licensing, but it's a no fault system. They realize that gear does get lost for legitimate reasons. And as long as a harvester will report that gear, that it is lost um, and it is appropriately marked, then if that gear is found, then there is no there is no penalty to the fisher. So it's a non-punitive system that encourages fishers to um, report that gear. And it also helps contribute to data collection and linking to the previous question, Sarah, that would also help um, potentially identify whether um, an entanglement issue is in lost gear because it's been reported lost and it's identified and you find that later on then you can start to get to the bottom of that question as well so um, if anyone else is interested in those types of things I mean that's an example of what some national governments can do uh, to try to solve the issue or try to address it anyway. Tricky question but thank you so much for answering this one and what you just talked about um, I think there's one question which we can link to it um, can port authorities play a role in stimulating fishing boats to bring used gear to ports by some form of a register? I mean, w w apart from the register piece, that's exactly what was being done at the, the Harbor Authority that I was working at was, you know, giving them a, an opportunity to get rid of their gear uh, at no cost to them, because otherwise they're paying to have it disposed of in a landfill, whether it's through the Harbor Authority's um, fees, because it's a nonprofit organization, or whether they were having to do it themselves, or they were having to pay storage fees on a net that was never going to be used again. So that's one incentive to, for fishers to bring back their net and have it disposed of at no cost to them. There's also been reports of fishers picking things up while they're out there in their net um, and then bringing it back to shore and then being charged to have that stuff disposed of. So, you know, that's a barrier to, to fishers doing that too. If they're having to pay to the disposal costs for the things that they're bringing back that they hadn't had, didn't have anything to do with, you know, there are some, um, there are some uh, barriers there as well. Um, I do think though that um, some sort of a register or something like that, one thing we are adding to our data portal that I mentioned is the ability to track what happens to gear at the end of its life. This is in its infancy now, but it will be um, there so that we can gather data on what's happening from these organizations as well. So some form of a register um, would be a good idea and hopefully we can get access to some of that data as it comes through. Thank you very I just much. wanted to jump in as well, just as a follow-on point, and I'm sure Alex, you might you might be able to 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 add some as well. But it, one of the main um, elements of the GNI, with um, obviously the geophysical survey industry, is encouraging action and proactivity, and seeing actually companies land these uh, re reclaimed nets um, and and go secure, bringing it ashore, disposing of it, tracking it. It's a very good initiative for them. It, it, it encourages them. Um, it's in, in many ways, it's a very good green initiative for these companies. Um, the, I, I know of certain companies we, we've worked with, they, they have uh, almost like it's like a competition of sorts to see which vessels can retrieve the most ghost gear. Um, and it's fantastic to see people get energized about this, obviously helping the environment also being able to uh, to protect uh, project equipment as well. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And I think one of the main things um, with our guidance is it's, it's trying to make companies be more prepared. So obviously this uh, entanglement guidance is specifically been uh, created for the geophysical side, but actually it, it can be applied to other marine sectors as well. So making sure that companies are prepared uh, kind of follows into an earlier question as well with how can you prepare and add these into uh, EIA as well. Uh, we have a section in, in the guidance for this as well, encouraging that this is done pre-project planning so that companies actually um, before even start a project that they, they have these these systems in place and they know what to do. So um, Alex, maybe you, you want to jump in on that as well, but uh, I, I just wanted to make sure I added that. Thank you. No, that's exactly right. You know, I think it really does come down to to preparation and planning. And actually we have our, our own separate EIA guidance uh, document that's for our members exclusively. It's like a 450 page document that walks through every single section of the EIA and how to prepare and ensure that you're um, readily available to to respond to any of these situations that may arise. Um, I you know I do apologize. It's nine o'clock here. Um, I have to drop off. I have another commitment. But if anybody has more questions or you'd like to chat more about the GoSet initiative, please send me an email. Um, it's alorero at energyoalliance.org. So please do be in touch. And thank you all for having me this morning. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, looking at the time, I think I would just ask one more question. Um, 
The next one, uh, which is, um, it got liked by a lot of people. So um, working in subsea construction in North Sea oil industry, we occasionally find entangled ghost gear. Who should we report these to other than the asset owners? Sorry, I was looking for my mute button there. I think um, the asset owner is great um, if it is marked. Uh, if it does have markings on it, that's terrific. That will also help you um, hopefully understand which country it came from so that you can um, report it to National Fisheries Authority there. Um, there may or may not be a formalized process for that type of reporting, uh, depending on which country you're in. Um, I would also say that, I mean, if it can be reported to the Triple GI's data portal simply by, you know, contacting us or, or you know, sending us an email or doing it through the Ghost Gear Report Reporter app, which is freely available on the on the Apple App Store and the Android Google Play Store, um, that would be great because then we maintain a record of it. The whole purpose of the Triple GI's data portal is to collect as much data as possible, but also to make sure that as much of that data is publicly accessible, shareable as possible, so that we can contribute um, as much uh, data as possible to the research efforts that are ongoing to help make fisheries management decisions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, I would say if there is a formalized process in whatever country uh, the gear originates from, that would be one thing. But uh, the Triple GI data portal, in in all other cases or or in those cases as well, just to make sure that it goes somewhere, that's the idea behind it. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure about the time, Nero. Should I just continue and ask a few more questions because there are still coming in some questions. Um, how, how do our panel feel? Uh, Sarah, Joel, do you have a, a five more minutes or would you like to wrap up? I've got five minutes, sure. Um, there's one, okay. one question uh, from Kate. Uh, I really wanted to ask you that because um, I think she really wants an answer for that one. Um, I'm looking at epigenetic impacts of entanglement, PhD. What other research is going on into understanding the effects of these stress events in your areas? Well, I mean, there, there's an awful lot of research happening on whale entanglements off the east coast of the US, of course, because of the uh, critically endangered status of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, and so I, I think that's where a huge amount of effort is involved, looking at all different aspects of entanglement. Um, so, so that would be a good place to start. And, and I assume that she's probably engaging with researchers working off the east coast of the states. Um, I think because the population of North Atlantic white whales there numbers just a few hundred individuals. Um, and that problem has been known about for, um, well, for, for decades, really. Uh, and because the US is one of the few countries in the world that has marine mammal legislation that is robust enough to really deal with issues like this, then, um, then there's a kind of a whole chain of um, events that have to be set up to, to tackle entanglements to try and bring the numbers down. Um, and, and it's a difficult issue in an area where fishing is, um, is a really important economy um, and there's a critically endangered species. But um, so I think that's probably where the most progress has been made. There are efforts in other parts of the world including the west coast of the US where, um, where humpback whales are entangled and, and the west coast of Australia, um, yeah, where they've resolved the problem actually um, in, in recent years. Um, but, but I think probably the most research is, is uh, on the east coast of the US. And just very quickly to add to that, um, there are some mitigation implementation or mitigation measures that have been suggested and are being tested at the moment, particularly for the North Atlantic right whale, um, where we're talking about things like time tension line cutters, where if there's a specific amount of tension on the line, uh, the vertical line that's in the water for enough time, then the rope will just get cut automatically so that the, you know, if it is an entanglement issue, then the whale is not dragging around that rope for, um, you know, Obviously, it's the the weight of that uh, of whatever it's dragging behind, causing that uh, rope to pull on uh, whatever it's pulling on on the whale, um, or whatever's getting entangled. So there are mitigative issues. There's there's things like so-called ropeless gear, where you don't have vertical lines in the water unless you're harvesting it. There's true ropeless gear. There's a whole bunch of things that are being implemented. That doesn't speak necessarily to the uh, the welfare issue, but just to say that there are some things that are being tested in that area um, to try to mitigate the impacts of um, of that particular gear. Thank you. 
Um, all right, two more questions. I will do it very quickly. So uh, one is for Sarah. Um, how aware are the Scottish fishermen of the efforts of BDMLR and large disentanglement response? Do they report events when discovered? So from what we've learned from the project in the last couple of years is that fishermen on the whole weren't really aware that entanglement was, was an issue at all. And if they encountered a live whale that was entangled in their gear, what they would most often do is, um, is work with other local fishermen around them that live in the area to, to disentangle the animal. And so um, one of the things that happened as a part of this project was that there was um, a disentanglement training because, of course, um, it's very dangerous to disentangle large, any large animal, but particularly animals the size of, of minke whales, um, basking sharks and humpback whales. And so, so I think fishermen are much more aware now about the efforts that British divers and marine life undertake. Um, so BDMLR um, have run disentanglement training for a long time. They have a specialised team that, that deal with disentanglements and, um, and that those efforts are now being um, expanded to include the fishermen um, educating fishermen about what they can use on board their vessel to disentangle the whale, which bits of um, rope to cut first to give the whale the best chance of survival, but also getting rid of the gear um, and, and safely, of course. And ultimately, that's the most important thing, doing it safely. So uh, we've come a long way. Um, the fishing, the Scottish creel fishing sector tends to be made up of um, local fishermen who, who work quite close to their home port, they're not a big organised um, fishing community. And so um, you have to engage with them locally and individually. We can't just talk to a fishing representative who will provide that information. And so there's still a lot of effort to be done to, um, to raise awareness among fishermen to, to try and improve the situation. But, um, but I think things are definitely moving in the right direction. Um, and yeah, and the efforts that BDMLR are undertaking to train the fishermen ha has been a really important uh, and powerful part of the project. Thank you so much. Um, now the last question is a tricky one again, I guess. Um, how confident are the speakers that international initiatives in this area, such as those from the IMO, FAO, will make an impact? Do they move too slowly? <laughs> Any opinions on that one? Um, if we're talking about, I mean, as we mentioned previously, the, a lot of the guidance is voluntary. So the stuff from FAO is going to be voluntary. The stuff from Triple GI is voluntary. Um, stuff from IMO um, will generally be enforceable. Um, I think there's two things at play. One, at Triple GI, we like to we like to say that. Um, We'd like to do it correctly rather than quickly, uh, whatever it is. Um, now, not not just to say that there's a you know reason to drag feet or anything, but that these processes do take time. It's a very complicated issue a lot of the time, so you need to take a lot of different um, opinions and feedback into consideration if you're going to come up with something that's going to actually be adopted, which is what we did with the best practice frameworks. Um, I will say though that despite most of the guidance at this point anyway, being voluntary, and Sarah, I'd like to hear your opinion on this as well, but it's been mentioned by both Sarah and Alex, um, is that once you engage positively with the fishers, even if it is voluntary, they generally engage quite positively with it. And we see this as well. Um, a lot of it's education and a lot of it is um, that positive engagement no, no fisher ever wants to see their gear around a whale or a turtle or a dolphin or whatever it is. Um, and so if there's something they can do to prevent that, then they absolutely, in my experience, will uh, for the most part. And I think that um, we've seen this in our project work around the world. Every project that we do in some level works with fishers on the ground. Um, whether it's simple survey collection and understanding what's going on on the ground, involvement in workshops, or whether it's actually involving them in retrieval projects, fishers are involved uh, and they want to be involved. But um, Sarah, I'll maybe get your thoughts on that too. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, uh, uh, it's a very emotive topic. And, and as you say, Joel, a, a fisherman doesn't want to entangle an animal, um, but it takes up their time. It often means that they can lose their gear, but it's also just unpleasant. Um, and, and, you know, I think we can't underestimate the knowledge that fishermen have of their local patch as well. Um, they've been working with the types of gear that they're using often for decades and generations. And so 
I think, you know, fishermen often come up with the most innovative solutions. And so including them as part of the dialogue about how we're going to solve these problems is is really important. Um, I mean, we can't do it without bringing the fishermen along with us. They they're an integral part of the solutions. And and um, yeah, there's absolutely no doubt about that. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you so much, you too. Um, we are a little over the time, but we're done with all the questions and um, I'm handing over to Nira again. Yes. Thank you so much, Sidia. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Joel. And thanks to, thanks to Dr. Alex as well. Um, it was illuminating, it was very interesting. And uh, I would just like to say thank you to everybody involved. Um, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out um, through the IMRS um, or the, the emails that the, the panel has provided. Um, and if anyone is interested in joining our, our, our SIG, please, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I wish everyone the best. Thank you.